And then we saw the issue of endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and what that entails. And now we've gotten to these seven wonders, these seven things of the Spirit of the Word of God or for the church, however you want to call them. I call it this, this heavenly garden that God has planted for us, for us to be united in, for us to have uh, union and communion uh, in. And I want to just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 here to show you the, the opposite of, of not endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, what it looks like and how it would be addressed. And if you look here at verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, God is faithful by whom ye were called under the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Uh, the things that we are to be united in, perfectly joined together in, are not things that we conjure up. They're not things that we make up. They're not things that we, you know, employ our own wisdom and say this is what we are to be unified in. Uh, they are stipulated by God, and they are put forth in God's Word. And we're to be perfectly joined together in them. That's a high calling, practically speaking, within the church. Again, we don't have to make up the doctrines and the things that we are to be united in. We have the Word of God provided for us. The Spirit has gone to great lengths to get that uh, to us and, uh, and how God utilized the, uh, the authors of Scripture uh, in, in time past. But we need to now keep it. We need now to be perfectly joined together in it. And I think about, again, the, this time we're in together as a church and how applicable these things are. There's so many things that could divide us, things that we could bicker and complain about, things that we can murmur and, and grumble about. And in one sense, you'd be justified in doing so. But in another sense, you've got to realize, we need, we need to realize that those things can drive a wedge between us and instead of being perfectly joined together. Uh, in spiritual things and let that be the what dictates our fellowship uh, not the temporary carnal things now that's hard uh, but uh, we're able to we're able to do that and um, I'm thankful for the confidence I have in all of you uh, to be able to do that and, and the testimony of God's word working in you for so many years and now evident here this morning as well we'll come back to Ephesians chapter 4 We've gone down through this list, and now we've gotten to the last one. We see that Godhead is represented in this list. We saw the Spirit in verse 4. We've seen the Lord in verse 5, and now we see the Father in verse 6. We've seen the things that we've been identified with, one body. Uh, we've seen the issue of our hope in verse 4, uh, the one faith, the one baptism in verse 5. And again, now we get to the, the last one. I just want to, again, by way of review, have you remember the, the two parties that the Apostle Paul has brought up in Ephesians, the Jew and the Gentile, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. And then in time past, there was a middle wall of partition that, that God established, but there was also an animosity that was there that was established by the Jews and the Gentiles, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Instead of the circumcision being the light of the world, uh, they kind of cut off the rest of the Gentiles uh, towards, towards God, and that is what they were supposed to do. And now in Christ, in regards to the body of Christ, there's a, a unity, there's a, a oneness. And we saw that in chapter 2. If you glance there real quick, Ephesians 2 and verse 15. Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, as the, the Jews, the circumcision. And then he says, for through him we both, circumcision and uncircumcision, have access by one spirit unto the, the Father. And so this animosity that was real, that was thick, that was... Christ there to break this down one with another. There to recognize the Jew and the Gentile, one body, the, that the peace that Christ has made. When we think about that in regards to Ephesians 4, and although we don't have that same kind of distinction 
uh, today, even though it's still there. In Christ, that all changes. It all changes in regards to what he's planned and purpose, what he's provided for, and what he came to preach. in and it focuses on these seven things. Focus on these things, Ephesians. Focus on these things. Keep them. Endeavor to keep them in the bond of peace. And so now the last one, verse God and Father of all. We'll examine that. And then these expressions about the one God and Father of all. He's above all. One God and Father of all. Uh, notice here, he doesn't just say one God of all. He doesn't say one Father of all. Even though in one sense, yeah, in other contexts we can look at that he's, he's the God of all, right? He created everyone. Uh, but he's speaking father of all. He's not the father of the unbeliever. He's the father of the believer. He's the father of the one who is justified. that we enter into when we are baptized into Christ, that now God becomes our Father. Ephesians chapter 1. And look at some of these expressions that, we, that the Apostle Paul gives us. Begins this epistle, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is the God of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, our God. And he's our Father as well. Now that issue of, if, if we could distinguish maybe between the issue of God and Father. And I don't know if we can in one sense, but if we can, I would think that we could distinguish between the issue of, and I'm not meaning these are two different people, I'm just talking about the, the issue of God and Father, the issue of justification and the issue of being a part of the family of God based upon that justification. That when we are justified by one God, right, that we become a part of his family and he is now our Father. Come with me, if you will to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and come down towards the end. Actually, let's, let's start here in verse 19. I'm going to change it up on you again. We're going to start in verse 9. <laughs> Romans 3, verse 9. Paul says, what then are we? Now, who's the, who's the we? The we are in the context are the Jews. Him, Paul, being one. Are we better than they? Right, who's the they? The, the Gentiles. It says, no, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Are the Jew and the Gentile concerning being under sin one? They sure are before God. They're identified as one under sin, Jews and Gentiles. And he goes on to prove that very thing. They jump down to verse 19. He says, now we know that what so, things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that would have been the, the Jews particularly, but it also had a, a global effect in this sense. He says, and all the world may become guilty before God. Uh, listen, that law was given to the Jews. 
but a, a Gentile that came in contact with it. And it's why it was set up, the blessings and the curses on, on the two mounts there. Uh, I forget them off the top of my head. Um, my wife would know. Gebal and Ebal and Gerizim. The blessings and the curses. That when a Gentile would come through that those mountains, they would, they would have a, the issue of the law there reflected and they would see that they haven't kept it and they're cursed. Uh, that they're, they don't do the blessings and therefore they don't get the blessings and they're, they're cursed. And so the, it, would make, it would make the whole world guilty before him. There's no other nation that could come along and say, well, it's just the people of Israel that can't keep the law. Let me take my best shot. You take your best shot and you're going to find, that, find out that you're guilty. Because the law, when used lawfully, is not made for a righteous man. And there's administration of condemnation, an administration of death attached to it that condemns the whole world. And it takes what is already there and it produces guilt because it provides the knowledge of sin. And it does that upon everyone. So there, the whole world in that sense, although we can see the dispensational distinctives, we can also see the, the issue of the, uh, the world at large being involved in connection with the law. And he says in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall some flesh be justified. Is that what it says? No flesh. It doesn't matter the flesh of the Gentile or flesh of the, of the Jew. No flesh shall be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is, made, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto who? All. And upon all them that believe. And that's the all that Ephesians 4 is talking about. Those that this is upon. All right, now come down with me. I wanted to get down to verse... Uh, come down to verse 27. Speaking of justification by faith, he says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man, whether Jew or Gentile, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? What's the answer to that question? No, he's not the God of the Jews only, Right? Now notice he doesn't bring up the issue of him being father here. See, the father of the Jews only. He brings up the issue, is he, he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? The answer to that Paul gives, yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is how many gods? One God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So the circumcision and uncircumcision have one God when it comes to who justifies them. If you come over to Ephes uh, not Ephesians, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, it's in Romans when we really begin to see the issue of this, of the Father here. Romans 6, and just for time's sake, look at verse 4. He says, therefore we are buried with him, as Christ, by baptism in the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the who? Of the Father. The Father was involved in the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father is involved in, the, in the, us being identified in all of that, and then who we belong to. We belong to Him as Father. Come over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and look at verse 15. Here it is clear that we are a part of the family of God being justified and being identified in Christ. Romans 8, verse 15. For ye, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, who? Father. So he's our Father. So we are justified by one God, and we are identified with that one God, and he is our Father. We have one Father. He's one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and us in Christ, He's our one God and Father as well. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 3. Verse 3. 
First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is, how many? One God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So once again, we see one God in regards to salvation. Now come back to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. He's the one God and Father of all. Now this issue of Father again is family, familial terminology. And that whole issue uh, is resident within the Godhead themselves, uh, but also in regards to what is known as the, often described as the Davidic covenant. You know the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, he gives the initial details, the Psalms really spell out the Davidic covenant, and that is that Christ was going to take on flesh, and he was going to be a son to his father, who is God. And God would be a father to his son, the seed of David. The Apostle Paul, in the, in the first epistle, doctrinally, that we have, the issue of that Christ is made to the seed of David, he brings that up. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the last epistle that he writes, he says, don't forget that Christ is made according to the seed of David, according to my gospel. And the issue for that is because Christ comes as the seed of David, he takes on flesh, and that's what also describes this relationship that he has, right? At his baptism, during his, the earthly ministry of the Lord, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Therefore, you have God from the heavens declaring that the one in whom the spirit right like a dove descended upon this is my son for the for the manifestation for israel primarily that the son of god is here and god has declared this is my son therefore he is his father and the whole issue with that is that as the son he would do for israel what israel couldn't do for themselves and that is to bring them to glory Right? And bringing many sons to glory, the scriptures say. And so too with us. Uh, that he would bring those that are now his sons and daughters, having believed the gospel, that Christ could bring us to glory. He died, he was buried, he rose again, and he ascended to glory. That he might bring his people uh, to glory. And of course, that's spelled out uh, in the future and those kind of things, but that's not my, my point. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to see this family issue. This is a part of God's eternal purpose in Christ that he counseled before the world began. It is just that, uh, a treasure to him. It's according to his plan, and his purpose, it's according to his will. Look at Ephesians 1, and pick it up here in verse 3, where we left off earlier. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Uh, it's interesting, you got the holy and without blame, it's holiness and righteousness, more matters of like justice there. But then you see what follows right after it, in love. And then what follows that is verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So not only does he want you to be holy and without blame before him in love, but in part of that love is that what's the environment and the context and the framework of this love? He determines it, is that you would be before him, that you would be one of his children, that you would be one of his sons and daughters. And notice that it's according to the good pleasure of his will. That's why, again, the issue of 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 hating children and the whole issue with abortion. It's so contrary to God. It's so contrary to God. His eternal purpose is that we as his children would be before him in love. And that he went out to provide for that very thing through his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw the, the family issue in Ephesians 1. Uh, that wasn't the only place. Come over to Ephesians chapter 3. 
Ephesians chapter 3. And in Paul's second prayer here in verse 13, Ephesians 3 and verse 13. Ephesians 3 verse 13. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole, who, what, family, and heaven and earth is named. We're part of his family. He, he wants a whole family in heaven and earth, sons and daughters, whether that be Israel or the body of Christ, he wants and planned and purposed, and it's according to his good pleasure to have a family. It's going to be a big family. It's a wonderful thing. Now you might be thinking, you might look at your own family and be like, oh, I don't know if I want that. But in Christ, you want that, right? Especially when we'll have our glorified bodies and we won't have sin and corruption. It won't be the pain in the neck that maybe we are to someone and them to us, right? And we have the Spirit of God and the Word of God to work on those things even now, right? So that title of him being Father is rooted in the prophetic scriptures. It's in Paul's gospel and that we get to be a part of his family. Come over to John chapter 10. I just want you to see one of these verses here in regards to when Christ came that not only indicates, again, his, just his, his deity, but the, of course, the relationship and the oneness uh, that he had as a part of that being the Son of God. John chapter 10, look at verse 30. It's just a very short verse here, but he says, I and my Father are one. There's many other verses we could go and look at. Again, that that are not just solely uh, the issue of his deity. There, you know, there's passages in the Gospels that are just clearly the issue of his deity. But when you have the issue of, of not just that I and God are one, right, but I and my Father, that, that relationship there describes the, the unity and the oneness that they have. And we've been brought into that as we've been identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, come back to Ephesians 4. And let's move on here to this description now of one God and Father of all. And again, simply put, as you turn back to Ephesians, if we're believing the God of the Bible and the God is preached in the Scriptures and revealed in the Scriptures, then we don't have two different gods. He is one God. We believe in that one God, and God is one. Right? We have those Scriptures. But we all have the same God. So again, many things that can divide us, but this issue unifies us. This shows that there is a communion that we have in the fact that he's one God, and he's one God and Father of us all, right? Of all. Again, that all is all in the body. Over in John 8, verse 44, it talks about the Lord's dealing with the Pharisees, and he says, you are of your father, the devil. Uh, so God is not the father of the whole world. He's the creator, but he's not the father of the whole world. He's our father when we have been adopted into the family uh, in Christ Jesus. And so he is one God and father of all. Now he says, above all, through all, and in you all. The issue of uh, above all, through all, and in you all, some have said that above all, is speaking of, of God, the father, the through all is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and the in you all is speaking about the Spirit of God. However, he's already brought up the body. He's ar or, I'm sorry, he's already brought up the Lord. He's already brought up the Spirit. Here, this is a description about God. This is speaking of God, the Father's supremacy. It's speaking about his authority, particularly in the church. There's many scriptures that describe that, in the Psalms especially, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Again, in, in, in the Psalms, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised, 
He is to be feared above all gods. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. For I know the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Praise him, ye heaven, heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Right, So we have many psalms that describe that God is above all. But here he's talking about the church. He's talking about his, his place in the church. And the way that we see him above all is not only his location, but that he's through all and he's in all. And so what does it mean that he is above all? Well, come, come over to Ephesians chapter 1. And we've seen this already as we've gone through this epistle. One, he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means it isn't the Father that has the position at the right hand of the Father. The Father is the Father. And so we see, again, his authority, and we see his place in regards to the church. And it isn't the same place as the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things need to be understood to see the the plan and purpose and the power of the Godhead in regards to the church. Without them, he wouldn't be able to bring his purpose to pass. With them, we see his purpose and his wisdom and his power uh, executed to bring about who we are in Christ as the church and our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at this. Look at verse 19. Uh, uh, Jump up to verse 17 here, Paul's prayer. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Christ is not given the description of the Father of glory. He is given the description He's the Lord of glory in 1 Corinthians 2. But here He's describing the Father of glory. And He says that He may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. So again, when we talk about the issue of one God and Father of all, that He is above all, we see that He is above all in regards to the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. How do we see that as we go on? Well, first of all, this whole prayer is the issue of knowing more about the Father and what the Father has done and what the Father is getting accomplished and what is going to come to pass. So in verse 18, He says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling now we've seen that one of the seven wonders of the spirit is that we have one hope of our calling but our calling is his calling his hope right that's how it comes so again we see his preeminency in all of this he says in verse 19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power that's going to be the issue of through all He's above all, he's through all, and he's in all. The greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. Who wrought the power in Christ in this passage? The Father did. The Father did. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You have to understand the relationship between the Father and the Son because it is the basis in which you understand your relationship your relationship as God's son and daughter before the Father. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is not the Father. He is the Son of God. And He is is at the right hand of the Father. And we need to thank God that that is the case. We need to thank the Godhead that that is the case. Uh, because it is in Christ being identified with us and him being at the right hand of God that we might be identified with him for all eternity. But in this, we see that he is above all. He is not above all. He is not above Christ in the sense of his deity. But in regards to the issue of the, the, the church, Christ is the head of the church, we his body, but all that, that Christ is at the right hand of God, we the church, right underneath all that, it's all Christ at the right hand of the Father. He's above all. 
that highlights again His greatness. Notice this context brings above all more than just the issue of the church. Speaking of that power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It's a, a fascinating thing to think, one, between the Father and Son, there's no pride and there's no envy that Christ is at the right hand of the Father, even though it is one God, even though Christ is God. There is no, there's no envy, there is no, there is no pride. This is worked out perfectly in regards to the Godhead, in regards to uh, their wisdom. We see the Father, that the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Christ. So we see that amazing privilege that the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, has to, to bear that fullness of the Godhead. And we see no complaint by the Godhead that he would be the, the, the manifestation, right, the representation of this fullness. We don't see any of that going on in, in regards to Scripture. But he is one God and Father above all. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you're dealing with these passages, you're not dealing with the deity of Christ. It's implied that Christ is God. We, we know that. This is talking about Christ working out the counsel and purpose of the Godhead. Primarily in regards to what it means for us, without his perfect execution of it and his faithfulness of it, we cannot be a part of it. These passages oftentimes just get muddled down because they're, they're questioning the deity of Christ. That's implied. That's already come. You already come with that to the text. And so therefore, it's not a passage to determine whether Christ is God or not. That's, that's there. It's something entirely different. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, speaking of the resurrection of the dead, look, pick, pick it up here in verse 23. He says, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under, his, under him, it is manifest that he, that is the Father, that's God, is accepted, which did put all things under him. So the Father says, here you go, son, I put all things under your feet. But it's accepted that the Father is not put under him. This is, this is what they planned and counseled so that when sin came in and corruption came in, that when Christ came and took on flesh, that you could be identified in what God is doing for all eternity in relationship to the relationship between the Father and the Son. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be, what? All in all. Well, surely God is all in all through Christ. All things being subject unto Christ. But it's through the instrumentality of Christ doing what he does to deliver up the kingdom to God, that God may be all in all. That the, the wisdom and, and knowledge and, of, of God and his eternal purpose in Christ, the good pleasure of his will would be executed through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it would be through that that the Spirit of God would, would dwell in believers and that through all of that, God would be all in all. So Ephesians chapter 4, as we turn back there, the issue of him who is above all, there is no place. I mean, this is all-inclusive. 
even in regards to the position that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, has in the heavenly places. That God and our Father, who is above all, is our God and our Father. And the one who is at his right hand, that Lord, is our Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God that dwells in each and every one of us is the same Spirit that we have. We are intertwined with the Godhead now. What an amazing thing. He's above all. What about through and through all? This is the issue of his power. This is the issue of his energy, if you will, his, his ability to execute, his work. And not only that, I believe his zeal, his fervency in regards to his work. It's not just, the, it's not just his will. It's not even just the pleasure of his will. It's the good pleasure of his will. Those things are, are adjectives to describe, and the, and the superlatives to describe his will. And his will, he, he executes and he brings it to pass. We've already seen in Ephesians chapter 1 there the issue of the, his mighty power that he wrought in Christ. His mighty power, the, the exceeding greatness of his power that not only was wrought in Christ, but is wrought in you when you believe the gospel. He quickens you. And we've talked about that power before. It's, it's through all. He's through all. He's through all the, the church. Come over to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse 19. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So the, the issue of through and in are closely connected as the issue of above all because it's of the one God and Father of all. But here the issue of in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God. So yeah, he, he dwells in you, right? The Spirit of God dwells in you. But here in regards to God through all, this, this whole plan and purpose of being builded together for an habitation of God, that we would be a habitation of God. That's the issue again. He's not only above us in, in location, in, in, in cosmic geographical location, right? It, not only in regards to that, but he's in us, but he also he's working through us. We're his habitation. There's a lot that you do at your house. You get things done. And your life is in and out of that. And it's what what you work through in that sense well this body right there's so much that comes through this body of what you do and then when you look at the inner man and the outward man and and what you take in, in you know in your inner man and you use your body for it's it's through all that that those things come to pass and so here we see again god's power and his zeal come over to romans chapter 11 Romans chapter 11, we saw this when we were in Ephesians 1 and we came back to Romans 11 and we got these expressions of him, through him, and to him. These are a little different in Ephesians 4, uh, the issue of above all, through all, and in you all. But I do think that the through all is the same as through him. Romans 11 verse 36, he's talking about his counsel and his mind. And then in verse 36 it says, for of him, that is his counsel, his counsel is, of course, of him. The things that he's going to bring to pass are from what he's planned and purpose, for of him and through him. So not only does he think about it, right, but he also executes it. It's through him. And then what he counseled and that he executes comes to him. It's to him. It comes to fruition. He brings it to pass. It's the whole 
kit and caboodle, if you will, right? It's a purpose. It's, there's, there's a genesis of it in God. There's the, the means by which he's going to bring it to pass, and then the fruition of it all, the, the end of it all. And then we saw already in 1 Corinthians 15 that God is all in all, right? He is going to bring what he is planning and purpose to pass. He has the power to do it. Look at, uh, come back over to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Kind of looking at things at the, the macro level. Ephesians 1. We see in verse 8, in view of the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. There's the purpose, right? And here's the fruition of it. What is it all to? Then the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now look at what he's going to get at to the issue of through in verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. It's through him. How much through him? Look at, look at the macro level. Look at, um, come over to the Philippians with me. We can find it in Ephesians as well, but look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Time's sake, just pick it up in verse 6. Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, where? In you, right? Will perform it. There's the, there's the through. So again, the through and the in are very close. But he says, we'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Come over later to chapter 2. <coughs> chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's through him. If we're engaged in the will of God, it's essentially his, it's his will, right? With the good pleasure of his will, learning it and it in us and working out of us, it's through him. He's working that in us. This is the power to quicken. It's the power to raise. It's the power to seat. It's the power to deliver us from the power of darkness, Colossians chapter 1, and translate us into the kingdom of his dear, of his dear son. It's the issue of through. And he's through all. Every single one of us. Just look around when you get up afterwards and you think, the same work that God did in me, he did in every single one of us. He's above each and every one of us. He's through each and every one of us. And he's in each and every one of us. Come back to Ephesians 4 as we end here. Ephesians 4, and he says, and in you all. In one sense, this is kind of a mystery. What does it mean for God to be in you all? Obviously, we know it in connection with the Spirit of God. That's a little bit more easy for us to theologically consider, maybe. And we don't have time to go through all the verses that I had here. But, again, I made reference earlier when we looked at the issue of uh, I and the Father are one. And not just, again, being mindful that those might not just be dealing with the issue of His deity, but the issue of this relationship that the, God, that the second member of the Godhead now taking on flesh, unlike that he had when he was in heaven, prior to taking on flesh, that which he now has, not simply by deity, he is God, but in regards to what was promised when his, when his son would come, that it, he would be his son. And the, the, the unity, the flesh and blood, if I can put it that way, you know, 
you don't take that too far, but you, to drive the point home, right? The, the oneness that was there. In John 10, 38, it says, But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. John 14, 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verse 20 of the same chapter, At that day ye shall know I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 23 of the same chapter, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Surely we see what Paul teaches, that God is in us, Christ is in us, the Spirit of God is in us. We're a habitation of God through the Spirit, he says in Ephesians 2. He has made his abode in us. What a great privilege. Now you might think, well, geez, it doesn't seem like God's in me. But these are the things that are true. These are the things that he has taught us about himself and what he has put us in and what he's planted for us to keep. And that, by the way, just giving you one practical thing in connection with all that is that if you don't look at one another after the flesh, but if you look at one another after the Spirit, that person's believed the gospel that you're speaking to, that you're dealing with. If they believe the gospel, then whether they know these things or not, you now do. And what great responsibility that is to recognize that you're not just dealing with that person in their flesh and blood, you're dealing with gods in that person. The Spirit of God's in that person. Christ is in that person. And that ought to cause some, as he said in Philippians, to work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Because you're not just dealing with someone in, in their flesh, even though you're dealing with their flesh. You're dealing with oftentimes the things that are negative about them and the things that they're doing to offend you. But if they believe the gospel, you start to see these things. You start not judging by the flesh, but you judge after the Spirit. And now what that does is it gives you the capacity and the power to start endeavoring to keep this unity that we have and view them differently and, and relate with them on an entirely different basis so that it is not you, but Christ that lives in you, the Spirit that's living in you, God that's living in you through His Word, through the things that we have learned, that He might get all the honor and glory and that we might experience and benefit in the union and the fellowship as the one body that we are in Christ. So these things are really practical. Dealing with your attitude, dealing with your thoughts concerning one someone else that can easily, your thoughts, if they're after the flesh, they're bankrupt of these things or they're forgetful of these things, can cause you to easily cause contention and division and, 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 and anything but the unity and the communion. But when you have these things on your mind and you don't forget about them, you begin to realize I at least got seven things in common with that person. Seven things. I'm not a big numerology guy, but that's the number of, what, perfection? Completion. Number three, what is that? Complexion. There you go. So perfection. Seven things, perfect things that you have in common. And so you can take those seven things and let them be your fuel to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Well, next time we're going to be looking at the things further on down and, and see how these things work all the more together and how we can further walk worthy of the vocation we're with or called. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time to gather together. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for what these things do, not only giving us a knowledge of these, these seven wonders, if you will, but the, the, the issue of what they're able to work in us when we think about these things and uh, to apply them, to be renewed by them. And I pray that that would take place right away. We come together and gather together as a church that we are in Christ, and, but not only just to hear your word, but to, to take you now your word and in the spirit, not according to our flesh and our own wisdom, but according to your word and the, the spirit of God that dwells in us and apply these things one to another, that we might be all the more knit and compacted and, and joined together, not just in physical 
presence as we are now next to each other in a hotel, but that we would be in our hearts and our minds, a fellowship so deep that it can't help but manifest Christ to all those that experience it, that hear it amongst us. And Father, we pray that as that is manifest and as we grow in that more and more, that people would be curious because of it and that we would have ap- ap- opportunity then to communicate the gospel and why it is that we are so deeply united. It's because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Father, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. It's in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing one song.